This video is published under the Creative Commons license BYNCSA, which means attribution, non-commercial and share-alike. Third-party material has been used for which the permission is specified explicitly for every diagram, photograph or whatever has been used. Please mention the author as Andreas Pfennig, Products, Environment and Processes, Department of Chemical Engineering, Université de Liège, Belgium. A disclaimer applies. Welcome back to this video series on thermal unit operations. We are in the chapter on solvent extraction and I would like to give you a brief introduction and explain some of the basics. Now what is meant by solvent extraction? In principle extraction refers to all processes where a liquid is added to either a solid or a liquid starting stream, a feed stream. If it is added to a solid then it's called solids extraction. On the other hand side if it is added to a liquid then it's called either solvent extraction or liquid-liquid extraction. So the feed in that case is liquid and you add a liquid extractant to that. Well, solid extraction you of course know possibly you drank a coffee this morning or a tea. In both cases you have performed solids extraction. That's not the topic of this lecture. That's a separate lecture. Here we want to talk about solvent extraction that we have a feed which is liquid. And now we want to remove uh, some component from that so-called primary solvent from that feed phase, either because it's detrimental for further downstream processes or because it's our product. In both cases the process looks like that, so that's a general sketch of, the, of how solvent extraction works. We start out with a so-called raffinate phase, which consists of a primary solvent and a transfer component. To that phase we add a secondary solvent, an extract phase or extractant, whichever way you want to call it. And that pulls, so to speak, the transfer component from that primary solvent so that it enters into the secondary solvent. After the process we wind up with the so-called raffinate and the extract. Possibly you know that because that's quite colloquial language that you call something that you have produced by adding a liquid to something, you call that extract. Tea, for example, is an extract. But can be used for any extracting, any plant material or whatever, then it's, but then it's of course solids extraction. Liquid, extra liquid liquid extraction or solvent extraction in the ordinary kitchen isn't quite not as frequent, I would say. If you want to have an example, if you cook a soup, then of course you add an, well, an oil phase frequently to it. And the oil, for example, extracts the red dye from tomatoes or uh, chilies into the organic phase so that the, the oily phase becomes red. That's an extraction process if you want to think about extraction in the kitchen. Possibly there are better, better examples than that, but that gives you an idea how that works in principle. So the, in that case the transfer component would be the red color of the tomatoes. Okay, so this gives us an, an idea. The primary solvent and secondary solvent, that's more or less a technical description, so to speak, to make things more clear because I think that's quite easy to grasp that this is the primary solvent which first contains the transfer component. You add a secondary solvent and then the transfer component is transferred from the primary to the secondary solvent so that you wind up with raffinate and extract. This is very often called also extractant or extract phase. I mentioned that already and the raffinate phase is often also called just the feed because that's the feed that you actually want to purify for on, on which you want to perform the separation. Okay, so that gives us an idea about the schematic sketch. Now the question is of course, why should I add that additional phase to our system? Why don't I use distillation? Because then I don't have to add anything. That simplifies the further downstream processes. One component less in the system, in the process. So I don't need to remove it afterwards. In, the, in this case I have to deal possibly with the extract because I want to separate that. I want to recycle for example the extractant so I have to now separate the transfer uh, component from the secondary solvent I have, so that I can then recycle the extractant. Why that effort? Why do I want to have that additional effort? Well simply because in some cases other separation processes don't work. Especially because the well, most frequently encountered separation process in chemical industry at least possibly doesn't work and the possibly uh, and, and of course the most frequent separation process is distillation. So in which cases 
do we need to use extraction? Well, it's not really a bad second choice. It has also certain advantages as we will discuss later on in this video. It's not all negative, but it, it opens also significant chances. Well, one way, one case where you can't use distillation is, of course, if the key components are thermally sensitive or highly reactive. Reaction rates often depend on temperature, increase as a function of temperature, so you want to have a cold process. Extraction is a cold process, occurring at arbitrary temperatures, of course, but can be ambient. Thermally sensitive are pharmaceutical components, biologically active components, so enzymes, um, uh, um, amino acids, or so food ingredients, dyes that you have produced, whatever. All these things may be thermally sensitive, so you can't distill them. In that case, you can use uh, extraction um, to separate that. Then another option, another point is that you have high or low boiling points of your carrier components. In that case, you need uh, to operate at low pressure or at higher pressure, which means that the column walls of your distillation columns have to uh, have a higher thickness, which means that the equipment gets more expensive. So re rectification is more costly and also you have to supply the um, heat or the, the, you have to cool at temperatures which are not so nice, which where the, the, the heating energy or the cooling energy is more expensive. Then, of course, if the driving force for the dis uh, distillation is not sufficient, the driving force means the vapor-liquid equilibrium is not sufficient, uh, which means either the boiling points are relatively close to each other or you even have an azeotrope where you have no driving force anymore in the vapor-liquid equilibrium because the compositions are identical in vapor and liquid. So in that case, you have to think about other separation processes. Well, there are tricks around that, of course, again, adding other components, but you can also think about solvent extraction. Then a completely different story is mentioned in the next point. If you want to separate a class of components which have a certain wide range of boiling points from simultaneously from a liquid mixture, where the other components also have a wide mixing uh, boiling point range. Example is, for example, to separate aromatics from non-aromatics. They need something that pulls out, so to speak, only the aromatics. But since the aromatics have a wide boiling point range, possibly, and the non-aromatics as well, which may overlap, you are not able to separate them as groups, so to speak, by distillation. That doesn't work. So you can't separate by boiling point. But you may find a selective extractant which pulls out only the arom aromatic components. And actually that works. So it's possible to realize that by extraction. It's just one example, of course. The last point mentioned here, there may be, may be more, but this is the last point mentioned here, is that you, if you have a low concentration of your transfer component in the raffinate phase. Because if you then would want to perform distillation, you would need to evaporate a large fraction of the entire feed, so also of this large rest of your primary solvent, in order to build up the countercurrent flow in the distillation column. And that is, of course, not so good. Yeah, that you need to put energy into that just to boil around something that you actually don't want to separate. It's much more efficient to add a small flow rate of a optimal extractant because they can possibly pull the transfer component into the extractant phase if the selectivity is high enough with a relatively low flow rate of that extractant. And in that case, of course, extraction is quite beneficial. Of course, all these are more or less economic considerations. So actually, you would need to set up basic ideas, basic balances, a basic design on shortcut based on shortcut methods possibly which allow you to estimate the cost so that you can then decide should I go for solvent extraction instead of distillation, absorption, desorption or whatever. Now having discussed that, we know how, distill how extraction works. We know when it should be applied, but now the question is of course how is it realized? Can we get an easy picture of how that is really operated? And for that I would show, like to show you some basic equipment. And that's actually quite nice, the first equipment that I want to show, because that at the same time represents more or less exactly one theoretical stage. So it's a very nice con concept to realize actually one theoretical stage more or less. So we have the two phases, the extractant and the feed. 
you mix them so you produce a dispersion. That way you increase the interfacial area, which is the mass transfer area, so the volume-specific droplet surface is then your mass transfer area and you want to increase that so that mass transfer is fast enough. Residence times of some few minutes are typically fully sufficient. Then you transfer that into a, a more quiescent uh, region, equipment, uh, horizontally arranged big tubes or a vessel more or less, which is elongated. And there the two phases have, have enough time to separate. Flow rates in the settler are somewhere on around 1 cm per second, 2 cm per second, for example. So if you have high flow rates, it has to be a big equipment, of course. And then the two phases separate. So the droplets meet that because of the, the um, uh, gravity. They uh, are driven towards the major interface, the sediment. There they meet. There at the latest they meet. And then if, if they have enough time, they will coalesce. That, so they will join, coalesce, and finally join to form a coherent uh, phase. And then you can separate the raffinate and the extract as two, two clear phases in the ideal case. Of course, there's much more story to be told how that really works, but that are expert courses, so to speak, that is not relevant in this basic course. So in that case, you wind up with the extract and the raffinate, and one should actually say, hmm, there are many variables. On the one hand side, you don't know which of the phases is the dispersed phase. Either phase can be dispersed. It depends on the phase ratios, for example. Not necessarily only, but also on other, other uh, properties. So you don't know which of the phases is the dispersed phase. And also you don't know which is the top and which is the bottom phase, because that it depends on the density difference. So the two can also be inverse. That's why I actually wrote this extract and refinate in black in the middle, more in a neutral way. So Either way around, this way around, or the opposite way around, you find extract and raffinate at the end of the process. And they are more or less in equilibrium because you have sufficient time here in your mixer set, in your mixer typically, to realize really equilibrium. So this is a single stage mixer settler, one theoretical stage. Now, of course, we realized from, well, discussing distillation, or but also from the general uh, considerations, that in principle, of course, we sometimes would like apparently to have more than one theoretical stage. And how can that be realized? So there are two options to do that. One is to use the cross-flow mixer settler battery. So if you combine several individual mixer settlers in a series, you call that mixer settler battery. And you can realize it as a cross-flow battery or as a counter-current battery. So let's start with the cross-flow battery. In that case, one phase is passing through the equipment and the other phase is being split so that it passes through each of the stages individually, each of the mixer settlers. So the feed, the raffinate phase, is entering to stage one, separated, then fed into the second mixer settler, mixed, separated, fed into the uh, third mixer settler, mixed, separated, and then leaving the equipment. The extractant, on the other hand side, is split so that you have a supply to each of the mixer settlers. And in each mixer settler, it's mixed, phase separated, and directly leaving the equipment. Of course, you can join the three extracts that you have, but you can also treat them individually. Depends on what the goal of the process is, of course. So that realizes apparently a cross-flow mixer settler. Quite easily visible. Um, of course, in, in that way, you, in each stage, so to speak, you maximize the driving force for uh, the separation because you always add fresh, new extractant. And that means that you get a um, quite fast, quite quickly, a low uh, concentration uh, of your transfer component in the raffinate. On the other hand side, you need quite large volume flow rates to realize that. So the typical case that you frequently apply is the countercurrent mixer settler battery, where you have more or less, you try to get a more or less constant driving force along the entire process. And here we see that the red phase, the raffinate or feed phase in this case, has the same flow direction as before. So we again have three mixer settlers. The feed is again entering the first stage and leaving the third mixer settler. The extractant is now fed to the third mixer settler mixed with the raffinate, phase separated, and then the extract is fed back into the stage two. Mixed, separated, fed back into stage one, so that finally extract one will leave the entire 
uh, mixer settler battery. So that way we realize a flow of extractant from right to left and our raffinate or feed is flowing from left to right. So indeed we have a countercurrent process. Of course a countercurrent process can also be realized in an extraction column uh, where we can for example have our feed from the top and the raffinate is then leaving the column at the bottom or vice versa, uh, and vice versa we have the extractant in the opposite direction which then leaves the column as, at, as the extract. The column of course is equipped with suitable internals. We will discuss that later when we discuss the different types of columns. At this point it is fully sufficient to, just to, to have a look at, like, at that like this. Again one has to say we don't know which of the phases is being the dispersed phase and we also don't know actually if it is this way around or the opposite. Possibly the extractant is fed from the top and the feed is fed from the bottom. Depends on the density differences of the two phases. But this is, so this is just one example and that is again uh, one of the most frequent examples so to speak so that very often the feed is being the aqueous phase and the extractant is an organic phase. It's a, it's a frequent case and in that case of course the orientation is like this and often also the extractant is suitably chosen so that you need a relatively low flow rate and in that case it may be wise, it's not always a given but it may be wise that that is realized as the dispersed phase, so that the extractant phase is actually that phase which is being dispersed. To give you a little bit more a clearer view of how that really operates, just as an example of one of the many uh, options that exist, I present here a sieve tray column. So we have sieve trays which we already know from uh, distillation. So these are, if you want to spare that out, dual flow sieve trays. So both phases are passing through the same holes. The Organic phase or the lighter phase actually in this case is being uh, dis the dispersed phase. The so droplets are being produced at the bottom of the column passing through the sieve trays collected up here. So there is some quiescent zone where the droplets can meet and coalesce so that you remove a coherent phase at the top, a coherent dis originally dispersed phase. Of course the continuous phase has to be added below that is then leaving the column at the bottom below actually the inlet of the dispersed phase. What you also see here is that you need to add pulsation, you need to add energy. So this is moving back, is a piston moving back and forth so that the entire volume of the column is moving up and down. Well, not that much, only some centimeters or so. Um, and that is actually required if you compare that to distillation. In distillation you have a high density difference between the phases and that is typically sufficient together with the flow rate to have to introduce enough energy into the system to produce small bubbles and small droplets. Here in solvent extraction actually the density difference is much less, a factor of 10 or so, or well, 5 to 10 less, which means the energy input is correspondingly significantly less, so you need more energy to overcome the interfacial tension to produce sufficiently small drops. So the typical drop size is of the order of 1.5 to 2.5 millimeters, so that's the diameter you are going for in typical extraction columns so that you have a sufficiently high volume specific surface area, volume specific mass transfer area. And then there are certain effects occurring at each individual drop which are then taking care of the extraction process to take place which is of course key is the mass transfer then you have the coalescence and the breakage already along the column and then of course the droplet sediment so that they move in, in one direction. And as I said before actually uh, this is a typical case where the organic phase is the lighter phase, is dispersed, is moving upward and is in that case possibly also the extractant phase. As I said, everything can be the other way around. Even it can happen if you have some chlorinated or fluorinated uh, organic phase that can even be heavier than water. So everything can, is possible with respect to direction of flow and direction of dispersion. So that has to be decided early on in the process design. So which way around that is really organized. To give you even a more vivid picture of how that looks like, I want to show a video taken in a, in a pilot plant on a pilot plant extraction column where you see it's a sieve tray. So these are the small sieves. The diameter is actually five centimeters. And now you see in this case, actually not the liquid is pulsed, pulsated, but actually the, the sieve trays are moving up and down and you see the droplets, how they are sedimenting towards the top. You don't see the flow of the continuous phase. Apparently it's, it's continuous, so you don't see any flow in there. 
So that's how it looks like. And this is actually the size, the five centimeters diameter, which is sufficient to scale up to really technical equipment. So that's really a typical pilot plant equipment. Now, of course, after having discussed all that, the question is, well, we have to add an additional phase. This is, of course, as I said, it's uh, causing trouble because it adds another substance to the entire process, which afterwards has to be removed, especially if you want to recycle the extractant. You have to separate mass transfer component and extractant. Uh, so ad additional effort is required. But, of course, as I mentioned already, it's a benefit in some cases because it allows, it gives you an additional degree of freedom. And the degree of freedom is, so to speak, worked out here in, in this list, so to speak, because you have the freedom of choice to choose it in an optimal way. And now, how is it optimally chosen? Of course, and if you watched the video on uh, thermodynamics recapitulation, we, we discussed that there already. It should be, the, the extractant should be insoluble, more or less, in the... Uh, raffinate, which means primary and secondary solvents should be as little soluble in each other as possible. That's not always the case. Sometimes you have to live with solvents which are not sufficiently insoluble in, in your uh, raffinate, but nevertheless you would like to have it as large as possible. So you would like to have a large miscibility gap between primary and secondary solvent. And then comes actually that point which ensures that you have a high driving force and that actually allows you to get better than distillation with respect to, to the cost for the overall process. Because you can choose your extractant such that it has an extremely high selectivity for the transfer component. And of course the capacity on the other hand side has to be sufficiently high. So the solubility of your transfer component in the extractant uh, should be high enough. Now to work that out a little bit more in detail, I uh, want to present the equilibrium for two cases. Both are represented with the same binodal curve on the one hand side, but with a different slope of the tie line, a positive slope and the negative slope of this red tie line. And what we actually want to represent is that we have a feed, so a raffinate phase and an extractant, which we mix, single stage, we mix them, so we get a mixing point. And then we plot the tie line through that mixing point, And that, of course, characterizes then the phase split that occurs, so this is, are then the exiting streams from, from a single stage mixer settler battery, for example. Or well, generally speaking, a single stage extractor, extractor. And we see if the slope is positive, then the concentration of transfer component 3 in the extract is significantly higher. So this is the extract, this is the raffinate side, so the concentration of the extract is much higher as compared to the raffinate. And you can project that, so to, so to speak, into the extractant free system 1.3. So that's actually where you want to perform the separation for between these components because they come mixed as, as the feed. And then you see how much it is separated, removing the concentration of the, of the extractant. And you see that the E prime over R prime is, for example, relatively high in that case. On the other hand side, if the slope is negative, you nevertheless get a certain, well, if you project that into the extractant free system, you still realize there is an enrichment of component 3 in the extractant as compared to, to, to this, uh, this raffinate here, this R prime. But the, the ratio is much less. So the ratio of the E prime to R prime tells you something about the, the enrichment that you can achieve. On the other hand side, you realize apparently that the concentration here is not so high. So you can perform extraction also in this case, it's possible, but you need either very high flow rates of your extractant or you need a relatively large number of theoretical stages, larger both of these variables as on that side where the selectivity directly is much higher. So this case is possible, but it's more effort. So now let's look again at the list. So that explains a little bit the selectivity. Then, of course, you have to also consider the further downstream processes. As I said, you frequently want to recycle your extraction. That you means you need to separate extraction from your mass transfer components. So they should not perform, that should not have an azeotrope, for example, so that you can use distillation quite efficiently. So that would be beneficial. In general, you have to, generally speaking, regard the further downstream processes simply that may be required. And that allows you then to uh, select uh, better uh, the better uh, extractants.
The next points relate to really the pr extraction process itself. The de density difference between the two phases should be high enough so that you have sufficiently fast uh, sedimentation of the drops because otherwise the throughput through, the, through a column would not be sufficiently high or for the setter it would take excessively long until the two phases separate. Which is not mentioned here, the viscosity should not be too high possibly, but well, columns are operated also or extractions operate also at extremely high viscosity, so everything is possible depends always on the value of your, your components that you want to separate. So if you have pharmaceutical ingredients then of course uh, quite slow processes are permissible. Interfacial tension should be an intermediate range simply because it is, if it is too low then the system has a tendency to form stable emulsions so it's too easy to split the drops so that they become too small and form a stable emulsion. On the other hand side if the interfacial tension is too high then the, you require a relatively large energy to overcome the interfacial tension because that has to be overcome if you want to split a drop. So if you want to have a sufficiently high uh, mass transfer area per volume, so volume specific mass transfer area, you have to add lots of energy if the interfacial tension is too high. This is typically not such a big problem. You can add a little bit more energy, it's not typically not excessive. It can become excessive, so you should keep that in mind possibly. It's, but it's often not really the limiting uh, case. On the other hand side, uh, a parameter which is quite important is the coalescence behavior. That should be manageable. How is that characterized? Well, a simple way to characterize it is that you have the two-phase system, you shake it, so to speak, in some shaking flask, say a liter or so, um, and then you let it rest and observe on, uh, how long it takes until two, the two phases have separated. And if that is less than 300 seconds, more or less as a rule of thumb, one can say then it can be operated in uh, that the, the extractor is suitable for uh, solvent extraction. But also there, this is just a very broad guideline and actually characterizing the coalescence behavior is again a topic for an ex expert course and not for this basic lecture. Because it depends, for example, on all the impurities that are present in the system, especially ionic species. So ionic surfactants, salts that are present in the system. So you have to keep track of those if you want to control that. On the other hand side, there are of course the typical re, uh, points for auxiliary uh, components for any process. They should be non-corrosive, non-toxic, non-flammable, environmentally friendly. The um, uh, ATEX rules should be easy, so the explosion um, uh, boundary conditions should be suitable so that you can handle that easily and so on, all these things. And then finally, it should be cheap and available and with, well cheap it's obvious, with available, available I mean that it should be um, available from more than one supplier because if there's only one supplier and that for some reason decides to shut down the process of producing that, then they are lost. Because then you possibly have to uh, produce that extractant yourself and that then can lead to a much too high uh, cost for the overall extraction process or the entire production process of your final product. So you should check that there are sufficient suppliers because it can indeed happen. It, uh, some person from industry actually told me they were doing reactive extraction and that reactive extraction was then discontinued by the supplier and then they had to produce it themselves. Not so positive of course. So these are the criteria for solvent extraction. With that I'm more or less at the end of this introductory lecture. I just want to summarize. On the one hand side I've shown that solvent extraction can be used if the liquid 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 equilibria supply sufficient driving force for the desired separation and that there is a chance, of course, also in adding this additional uh, auxiliary component, namely that the auxiliary component, the extractant, can be chosen, chosen so as to optimize the overall performance of the extraction process. With that I would like to say thank you and I hope to see you again in the next video.